My name is Steve Miriati. I'm the founder of the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, whose mission is to work with low-income youth on a global basis and teach them how to start small business, financial literacy, and the concept of ownership. In my hometown of Flint, Michigan, we were at that time the wealthiest town in America per capita because we had all of the Chevrolet plants with 39 auto plants longer than a mile. We made every Chevrolet in America, 90% of the Buicks, and did all the spark plugs for General Motors. I was very proud to grow up there. Because the wage rates were so high, starting at about the age of 10, I had to go into small businesses making 10 to $60 a week as I couldn't get a job in the factories because the, it was so competitive. And so by the time I went to college at 18, um, I had started with my best friend, Gary Voigt, uh, nine little businesses, one of which did close to $5,000 in two and a half months. So I, I was always thinking about opportunities. If I had a good product, I could sell to, to anybody. That was really the heart or the beginning of what I did professionally. I was 25 years old, I moved to New York City, and it was broad daylight, and I was in the FDR Park, which is on the Lower East Side of New York, and I was with my um, girlfriend, and <laughs> we got mugged by five, 12 or 13 year olds, and I did not defend us very well. In fact, I slipped and fell on my tushy. And my girlfriend, who is a phys ed major and you know a very strong person mentally and physically, yelled at the young men, and uh, they <laughs> they apologized and went away. And I felt kind of embarrassed and humiliated that I had. Uh, I guess forgotten how to fight at all. I'd never been a good fighter, but I was never, um, I, I would never run away. I would do the best I could. So <clears throat> I had a friend who was very famous. Her name was Ayn Rand, and she'd written all these famous novels, and my grandfather was her lawyer. And one day after this, a fiasco of a mugging where I didn't um, kind of live up to my bargain, so to speak. She said, what is wrong with you? You're not paying attention and your mind is wandering. And I said, no, that's not true. And I was very defensive. And she said, listen, I know a psychologist. His name's Albert Ellis. And his theory is you feel the way you think about something. And it's called rational emotive therapy. So I go to see him and he makes me write down what I feel ashamed of. And it was, I'm embarrassed because I didn't protect my girlfriend during a mugging of four 11 year olds. And she faced up to them and in one or two sentences, they uh, apologized and left. So she saved the day. And he said, that's so easy to fix. Just rewrite the sentence with you as a, as a hero with your girlfriend. So I rewrote the sentence that we had stood up to five young people and yelled at them and said, leave us alone, which was true. I left out the part that I slipped, fell, and cried. <laughs> and then I wrote that sentence 500 times. And 
it totally went away, these flashbacks. It was uh, a miracle uh, for me. I went back the next day to thank him and to bring him a little present. And he said, uh, you're not done yet. You've just begun your therapy. For the next two months, I want you to go teach at the most difficult high school in New York City. And that way you'll be able to flood the experience of having been humiliated and mugged. And flooding means you'll relive it over and over again. And it will totally go away. And you will be fearless and it will never come back. And so I did. I, three weeks later, I started teaching at Boys High in Bedford-Stuyvesant which was a very uh, intense school and the dropout rate was very high and there were, there were children that really, I don't think had ever felt love or kindness toward them. Don't feel they have a support system and that someone cares about them. Often we can drift off into a, a world that is really negative for them and can often hurt others. And it's a problem we're facing all around the world, but particularly and tragically right now in, in our own country with this dramatic rise in violent crime. So I was continually getting young people that were it was their first day of school after being incarcerated for a year. And I, I could not control the class at all. In one case, a young man came in and he set on fire the, um, the coat of the young woman sitting in front of him. And to me, that was extremely serious. So I, I got the security in, we called the police because she could have been uh, uh, scarred for life or, or worse. And that's when I realized I had to try something else. And I looked down and I had a watch on my uh, left hand. And without thinking about it, I never had a thought. I just took off the watch, walked back in, and yelled out, what would you pay for this? And that was the defining moment in my career. That changed everything. The class went stone cold silent. And everybody looked up and thought about the question. It was like I was at a seminar at Cambridge University in physics or something. And the change was so remarkable, which I subsequently saw hundreds of times during the next 40 years. But that moment, I realized the power of talking about basic economics, subjective value, what is the watch worth? Where would you buy it? How much would you sell it for? and what profit you could make. Essentially replicating my youth of having to make a livelihood during the summers when uh, my allowance was <laughs> uh, cut significantly to encourage me to get a job or to start a business. And the rest of the class, the next 30 minutes, was an incredible discussion where I said nothing but listened. And one kid would say, I could get that watch down on 30th and Broadway, and he was right. He knew about the wholesale markets. And I could get that 12 for $24, $2, and I could sell it here for 12, make a $10 profit before any of my other expenses. That was talent. And that was the first time I'd seen pure, unadulterated talent. And then I saw it again and again. And the comments were as sophisticated 
as when I was in graduate school getting an MBA and with much more energy and much more passion about business. There was a love for thinking about the entrepreneurial process, although none of them had heard the word entrepreneur at that time. But I realized that the school systems were teaching one way. I was, I was a math teacher, and yet the audience was desperate to talk about the issue of money. If you were without money for whatever reason, it's, it's life endangering. It, it changes your health care, it changes what you eat, it changes how you interact with people who might not have your best interests in heart. In every community I've ever been in, uh, low income, wealthy, middle class, there, tragically, there is always, for whatever reason, a group of young people, usually three to five, who take out their anger by bullying other children. And it's a huge problem, not only in America, but in every country I've ever been to. And if you face that situation and you are penniless, the chances of a tragedy happening, in my opinion, uh, go dramatically up. People that feel disempowered and um, isolated from a community or from uh, their families or loved ones or from any situation are often penniless. And that is very seldom discussed because of, of this fear that will embarrass somebody. I understand that totally, but having a private conversation with people who are literally impoverished, they don't have 10 cents, is if you don't know that, you can't understand violence, you can't understand theft, you can't understand the murder rate of young people which is so high, I don't even, I try not to think of it as so discouraging. And I think that's very important to understand the economic situation each human being is in without embarrassing them. That was my big career breakthrough. And that's what I've been thinking about. That was in 1982, is 2022. So I've been thinking about that every day for 40 years. I took thousands of young people um, with other teachers with me, of course, to the wholesale markets in New York and in Philly and uh, in parts of New Jersey. I wrote articles about it. I went on TV, I went on radio. It, to publicize this idea that every young person in the world should learn how to start a simple business so in case of an emergency they could always make some money for themselves and their family. The whole premise was being broke in a vernacular or being without any capital causes many other unforecasted tragedies. And I think I'm right. I thought I was right back then. I think even more strongly that I'm right today. And that is the central conversation around poverty. And poverty is the greatest war in, in the truest sense because it leads to all the um, a, a predecessors of war or, or a societal breakdown. And so I focused my career on that, on that uh, issue. Seven years go by, I get a little better every year. I work every night on the, on the lesson plans. I start to teach other teachers. 
And then I'm given this assignment by my principal, a wonderful woman who was my, became my mentor and my supporter in the South, South Bronx at Jean Adams Vocational High School, which has had a huge impact on my life. And she, she said, I believe in you and I think you're right. And nobody, nobody has said that before. And she said, I'm gonna give you 25 young people that have dropped out of school because they had committed a, a, a crime, many times a non-violent crime, um, in the sense that they were selling a drug or what have you. But some of them had actually hurt another human being and hence were never allowed to go back into a public school in New York City. And she said, I'm gonna give you these 25 children and I'm gonna put you in the Department of Housing for uh, two years and I'm gonna give you the authority to teach whatever you think is important. And your goal is to teach each child as much as you can and in my opinion, this is her talking, if you can get one of the 25 to graduate, that will be a huge home run. And I'm very proud, 19 of the 25 graduated and two subsequently did a year and a half later. What we did for two years is focused on financial literacy doing a checkbook, counting your money, knowing the difference between assets and liabilities, being able to do an income statement every single day. And I drilled into them to write down every cent they spent every day because when you're first getting started out, keeping track of your money and knowing how much you have, where it is, how to protect it, trains your mind for the next step of how to invest it and evaluate the risk and make a profit. If we could do that to the billion, the billion young people under the age of 17 globally that are in uh, the worst poverty conditions you can imagine. And by the way, that is a conservative estimate. It, it could be significantly higher because there's whole parts of the world where they don't actually uh, uh, spend time evaluating the uh, young people. They really don't know how the 13, 14, 15 year olds are doing, but it's at least a billion. If we could get those billion children en route to the craft of entrepreneurship or being part of a, of a business, learning how to save because savings is the future. My dream at the time was to have a school that gave a second chance to children that had really messed up. <laughs> the, first, second, or third time, and that school be called Second Chance. I came up with the alumni program. I came up with the, the idea that they'd go into the military, they'd start a business, or they'd get a job. Those would be the three objectives. But ultimately, they could do whatever they wanted with their life, which is the critical lesson for a teacher. Don't put your life on the student. Don't make them live your life. They have to find what their life is. And I would say that every day so I wouldn't forget it, how important that is. The number one characteristic of success in any field is grit. <laughs> the more you get knocked down 
and are able to get back up, the stronger your idea becomes in the universe or ethos. And it's more than just you become strong. That's actually a minor point. But the idea takes a power of its own. This is something I'd like to be remembered for as being part of the team that developed this. And this is a complete two-year class on how to start a business aimed at those who are under the age of 17. It has lesson plans, it has every topic in any MBA program, and I urge anyone who has a specialty and loves it and thinks that other people might want to learn it, to document what you do, to write a book, even if you self-publish it. Because otherwise, others will have to recreate all the work you've done and won't be able to stand on your shoulders to see further ahead.